now some uh, big picture perspective from Tony Dwyer, Senior Managing Director and Chief Equity Strategist at Colin Stewart. More than 700 U.S. financial institutions and hedge funds use his team's research and analysis. And just following there on, on what Scott said, how key is tomorrow's jobs number and what do you expect? These numbers get so revised, Matt. It's no number is key. I mean, if, if we're sitting here and you ask me, what was that one number two years ago that really made a difference for the market? We're not going to be able to come up with it. So again, it's an important number as it relates to the trend, and the trend is for better employment reports. And don't forget, a lot of these employment reports get significantly revised. If you go by the ADP report that was out, I think, yesterday or the day before, and you go by some of the ISM employment indices, you know, they're booming. The NFIB hiring plans are increasing, and that's really your re Is your booming a little bit dramatic? I mean, booming no. is what we saw before no. the financial crisis. No, it's a, booming is, it was climaxing at the end. You had already had a long trend of very strong reports. We're just starting to get into the very strong reports. The economy came from such a deep trough that it, it takes a while to actually turn the corner and get positive. Where do you expect to see, uh, here in your notes today, the fundamental backdrop is so terrific that any kind of weakness is temporary. Where do you see this strength coming from? Because the housing market hasn't been looking fantastic lately, and that's normally in a recover, recovery where you get the, uh, the V-shaped trajectory. Well, clearly it's in manufacturing. And again, you look at the Chicago PMI or the ISM today, and it was one of the highest levels in decades. The and again, going back to that, booming. The employment component of the Chicago ISM or the overall national manufacturing readings are the highest since 1983. So when you look at it, is that that is a good sign. In other words, the fear in the marketplace is that once the Fed stops QE2, that rates are going to spike and the market and economy are going to are going to trail off and end up in a double dip recession. There's no evidence in any of these data points where you've had just this sudden spike because of Fed buying and then it goes away. When you hang out with your buddies at the bar in the financial markets, are you like, come on, you guys are all too pessimistic. I see unemployment really recovering this year. I mean, where do you see it? Well, I try not to go to the bars to talk about the stock market. <laughs> I try to go to clients. When you're standing by the water cooler at <laughs> oh, one yeah, of your yeah. clients' offices, I mean, do you, are you the, one of the more optimistic guys among your peers I am. is what I'm I am, And I think the most important thing I can convey for the show is this. The only thing that leads to a sustainable decline in stock prices is a recession. The only thing that causes a recession or has in the last 60 years is an inverted yield curve. We have one of the steepest yield curves in the history of our country. So you've got to have to make it as a unique experience to go into a very quick recession with a yield curve this steep. And that's the most important part. As long as the economy is positive, earnings are positive. As long as earnings are positive, the market's positive. So it's just degree. And we think that you're in this period of low inflation, steep yield curve, improving loan demand, improving payrolls and income, and that's going to lead to a, a, a stronger growth in the economy than many are looking for. Well, hopefully you're right, especially for the sake of central banks, which are, yeah. seem to be now rolling up their sleeves and getting ready to fight an inflation expectation that's at least around the corner. Adam, you're watching central banks around the world get ready to, to sort of exit yeah, well, we got evidence of that uh, in Europe early this morning talking about rates going up. Listen to what our own regional Fed presidents are saying. James Bullard, St. Louis, quote, the economy is stronger and inflation is higher. These are all quotes in the past few days. Charles Evans, and he's wanted to keep rates low. Chicago, he says, to be sure, we see some increase in headline inflation. Tom Honig, he's been the hawk. Higher Fed funds, fund, Fed funds within a short period of time. All these guys are saying inflation starting to creep up. Let me show you something else. All right, here we go. Lowest on the block. We're talking two-year rates. Here's the U.S. down about three quarters of a percent. That's the two-year rate. Mexico, 104, Canada's 175. If our neighbors are already up there, how much longer can we stay down? Germany, China, Australia, take your pick. They're all up here. Tony Dwyer, question to you. When does this go up? Can we stay down here that much longer? Or are we getting pushed? No, I think we're going to go higher. And I think I'm probably the only guy on the planet that thinks that the Fed is going to raise rates in the early part of the second half of this year. I think that's true yeah, you're because on equities. That is, that is the best thing that can happen. The average, if you take any random period since 1926, the market's up 6% uh, on average. If you take how it acts a year after the first rate hike, it's up 8%. So you outperform by 200 basis points following the first rate hike. It's a sign that the economy is not going to double dip and is in the beginning of this emergence. And I think p people have just simply been too bearish on economic activity. And, and while it may cause a little bit of a correction, 
I certainly think that a higher, that a more aggressive Fed would be good right now. Hey, Tony, what about the idea, though, that because yields are so low, that it's sort of funneling people into stocks, the people who are in the markets right now, that they don't really know where else to put their money because they're not getting yield anywhere else. And so without that sort of impetus, if rates start to go up again, money's going to come out of stocks. I think people are, are jumping the gun, and it's, go, it's going into fixed income. I mean, you had an incredible amount. You had a never-before-seen level of corporate credit new issuance last week. You had more corporate credit new issuance last week than you had money going into all of fixed income funds by individual investors over the first quarter of the year. So we're, what the Fed is doing is they're creating an environment where you have to go up the risk scale. The, the first place you go in droves is in the fixed income market. That's now maxed out the returns there, which is eventually one of the reasons I'm so bullish, Matt, is that money to find the needed return it's going to have to have to match liabilities for pension funds, you're going to have to go into the equity market, which still offers an 8% earnings yield. And maybe they are at the top there in the fixed income market. Sheila has a little bit of uh, evidence, a look into the corporate side uh, of what Adam was saying here. Sheila? Yeah, of what Adam was saying, and actually what Tony was just saying, too. I've been taking a look at a lot of these corporate bond issuance figures. You know, right now, we are at the highest level that we have seen in two years. So just this year alone, we are talking about $989 billion of debt offerings. You know, you've had some huge monster offerings from companies like like Verizon, Santa Fe, Aventis. Tony, my question to you is a lot of people are saying if you take a look at these debt issuances, they're actually for growth purposes, whether it's M&A to expand CapEx, to expand facilities. How much of this do you think is actually fueling further growth in the economy? It's good. You go into a recession when companies need money but don't have any access to it. As you, as you just so clearly outlined, Joe, they have a ton of money. They have a ton of access to it. Uh, you know, that kind of money raising is unbelievable and unprecedented. That gives them the money to buy back stock, increase dividends, and do M&A, as well as fuel other pro-growth moves. So the best thing that can happen to the equity market is all the money goes into the fixed income market, maxes out the returns there, and then it doesn't necessarily have to go, you know, sell bonds and buy stocks. It's generally, you know, hold your bonds to maturity and put new money into stocks. Is there any threat that actually corporate credit uh, is getting a little bit too easy and that we could be seeing a replay of what we saw in 2008? Well, no, because you, you haven't gotten to 2004 yet. <laughs> you know, the, I mean, we, it's, if you notice, all these statistics are the best or, or worst, however you want to phrase it, since 2007 and 2008. Well, let's backtrack and look at what it was in 2004, where it first got to that level and then trended up. And that's where, in our view, we are. We're in a 1994, 2004 kind of environment where you're shifting from a Fed-driven economic support you know, life support. Each cycle they go into life support and then you go into the organic growth of the economy, which we're at. All right. Hey, Tony, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure having Thank you, you Tony Matt. Dwyer from Colin Stewart. We